Hines, and I'm a physician assistant at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and I've been in the vascular surgery department for going on 12 years. Um, I recently came into the role as director of the advanced practice. We have about 150 nurse practitioners and physician assistants in our surgery department, and Olga and Sophie are two of them. So if you need any plastic surgery, or orthopedic surgery, or vascular surgery, <laughs> You know who to call. Um, I'm very honored to have um, Dr. Dori Segev here tonight, who's going to just enlighten us on all the things that have been happening in the transplant surgery world over the past couple of years, and some really, really exciting stuff that you've probably seen in the news lately. Um, we were also supposed to have uh, Dr. Jean He here tonight. He is a pancreatic co biliary surgeon at Johns Hopkins who got called into an emergency case uh, for injury of one of those structures <laughs> in one of the other ORs. So he's not going to be able to join us tonight. Um, but we're very, very excited to have Dr. Sega up here. And I'll invite him up. And I think we're going to have the whole panel and then yeah, 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 yeah. do a little um, yep. special fireside chat with Dr. Sega. You know, there's a lot of things going on in healthcare right now, Dr. Segev. I don't need to tell you that, you know, far better than I do. But we definitely see some ramifications out there in the news, in politics and stuff like that. Gene and genetic engineering, stem cells, robotics, AI, blockchain, privacy. Where do you see as the big mega trends that you can discuss with us to kick it off? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was hoping your list wouldn't have AI or machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> that was after me. <laughs> well, no, it's fine. Because now I have to like take a piss on AI and machine learning. But yeah, I, I, so I think looking at the 30,000 foot view, I'll speak mostly to surgical stuff, but there's a big 30,000 foot view in all of healthcare. Um, I think one of the things that is evolving, as you know, and as we've already brought up, is the, um, the exponentially growing uh, availability of data. And a lot of people are trying to do a lot of things with those data, and some of the things are successful, and some of the things are um, are theoretically nice, but very, very difficult to move from the theoretically nice to the ever potentially practical. And a lot of that has to do with the heterogeneity of medicine, the heterogeneity of data collection, the heterogeneity of definitions even within data collection, the difficulty in, um, in combining you know, data that we get from different sources, and the difficulty in taking what happens in medicine from the perspective of physicians caring for patients, which is a human act, patients caring for themselves, which is a human act, and human physiology and our response to medicine, which is a act that we have very little understanding of, and trying to make sense of all of these using algorithms that are far more used to data that do make sense, and um, mechanistic frameworks that do make sense, is very challenging. And, you know, I, I admittedly do a huge amount of work in using the data that are available to create prediction models and patient decision making tools and um, and policy, a lot of, you know, what would happen if we change this policy and how would it impact patient behavior and physician behavior. And inevitably, every single time I present anything, there will be somebody in the audience who says, well, all of these things assume that I'm a rational being and I'm not a rational being, so how, how could any of this you know, in any way help anyone. And so I think that we are seeing a, an explosion of AI, machine learning, and healthcare. I think that um, there will be a lot of limitations to the dream because of the heterogeneity of everything. 
So maybe a better, as you said that, and that's brilliant, I think that maybe a better way to frame the question is, if you look at, you know, pay scales and, and performance, super high performers in most professions get paid the most, right? And we can have a debate about why that is and if that's right and whatnot. And inevitably what happens is that there is a, especially in professional services where it's one-on-one -on -one and it's human interaction, you have limits. There's, there's, how do you get leverage? How do I leverage a Dr. Doris to get? How do I multiply or give you a multiplier to what you do? Or what are the gating items that you see in your practice every day that if this was better, then I could be 30% more efficient? Well, so there's sort of the, um, the clinical practice aspect of it, and then there's the research aspect of it. Right, sure. Right. And we, let's put into research, innovation and development, et cetera. Um, the taking care of patients aspect of it is, I have to say, I have seen a decrease in our ability to take care of patients and a decrease in the efficiency of the medical care system because of the bureaucracy introduced sure. by things like EPIC. EPIC was supposed to be, you know, as a clinician, our view of EPIC is this monster that came in, <laughs> created three times the amount of work that we have to do for every single patient interaction that we've ever had, with the sale to hospitals that they will get these um, bonuses from payers and CMS and government, etc. That went away. Epic remained because people spent billions of dollars in incorporating Epic into their infrastructure. And now Epic is just a burdensome disaster in the care, the daily care of patients. And so, you know, I see these now. Will Epic turn into something that's useful from the research and from the development side? Possibly, if the data can be properly, you know. Uh, harvested and homogenized and studied and released by EPIC to people who are not part of EPIC's profit structure that can do something with those data. So, um, you know, things that we've introduced with the hopes of improving our practice in many ways on the tech side have actually added burden to the day-to-day -day practice may provide some um, insights on the research and development side. Interesting. So it's funny because government regulation and policies, practices seem to be the, a, a big gate item that you point to. And I'm not, uh, you're the expert, I don't disagree with that whatsoever. People have said that, and I talked to many different doctors, you know, when, when certain bills were passed, we're not going to get political and stuff. But what's interesting about that, particularly right now, when we're right on the verge of cloning, genetic engineering, stem cells, all these heavy duty things. And it's always two sides of the coin where things that can be much more effective can also be much more scary. That aren't we going to see more, or do you think that calls for more sort of policy step in? Yeah, so I think as we get into the innovation side, um, it's challenging because you want to make innovation possible but you want to make innovation safe and ethical. Um, the FDA is a good example. The FDA is considered basically the bane of all drug development because the regulations put on a, a pharmaceutical company to create new medications are so overbearing right. that a lot of companies are just pulling out and have no interest in doing that. And I've been down in DC many times working on FDA advisories and, you know, um, moderating conversations between the FDA and pharmaceutical companies, advising pharmaceutical companies on how to, how to progress. In the last few years, there actually has been some movement of the FDA to relax some of these regulations. For example, to, in, in, to introduce what are called uh, surrogate outcomes, right? So, for example, if we're going to develop a new drug, I'll use transplant as an example, but this generalizes. If we're going to develop a new drug um, for to prevent rejection of an organ, in the past, up until a couple of years ago, they required the endpoint to be patient survival. 
right? Which is reasonable when we're talking about oncology and you know, extending patient survival from six months to 12 months, but is unreasonable when we're talking about drugs that are more subtle than that. And so pharmaceutical companies were pulling out of the transplant field because it's impossible for them to design a study that's long enough and has enough samples to show that there's an improvement in patient survival. Recently, finally, after 15 years of negotiation, the FDA said, okay, well, we will allow surrogate outcomes for initial drug approval, and then, you know, you have a contingent approval that then 10 years, five years later, you have to show us that this has actually improved survival. So it's those sorts of things that you would think, well, this makes total sense. The FDA should definitely regulate these things and shouldn't allow drugs on the market that don't actually impact patient survival. But then you realize how much of a burden that is on a company to prove that, and then we don't make drugs, and then we don't improve our outcomes. And so, you know, those kind of taking what we do in the name of safety and what we do in the name of care, you know, careful approaches and releasing some of those restrictions actually does Im impact people more. Uh, it's amazing, it's funny because I, 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 when you talk, you're so smart, it's like I think of 10 things I wanna say right immediately, you know what I mean? I, don't, I have a radio show in Miami, I would love you to be on that show and talk about some of this stuff, but I wanna say a couple things right here to tee up, and I wanna bring Katie in this, because there's so many different angles I wanna hit this from. The day-to-day -day stuff that I think that people also miss too, and, and, and an expert in the field who's there day-to-day. -day. Okay. Are we in the regulatory challenges that you've just brought up? Are we in danger of losing the lead on a lot of these things? Stem cells, you see things now out of Columbia, Cayman Islands, Panama. Are we, oh, what about cloning? What about AI? All this, I mean, if we don't make some moves now, and I guess they did the right to try thing, there's some changes, but how close do you think we are of losing that edge. The second thing I'll throw on the table is we talk about now detection with AI and stuff like that, with mammograms, things like that. But how, what problems does that open up if, if the answers are in the black box? And maybe the clinicians themselves are like, I don't know how the computer came up with this, but the computer came up with this, although the results, I guess, are better, but now what challenges does that also pose? And then I would love to Katie to jump in with some day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah, two good questions. Um, did you say, when will we lose our edge, or when <laughs> did we lose our edge? No, no, don't go. No, I mean, look at a lot of the medical innovations coming from, there are more medical innovations coming from Israel, I would say, than from oh, San Francisco, gosh. right? I mean, we, we are losing our edge in a huge way. Most of the randomized trials in my field and in other fields in medicine are not being done in the United States anymore. There are European trials that are then brought over, the results are brought over to the US in the hopes of achieving you know, FDA approval or uh, device approval or something like that. We are already losing our edge. It is nearly impossible for people to do human subject research in the United States. And so, you know, I, I think we need to be, we need to be mindful of that. And if we are going to take the lead in these next areas, as you point out, in stem cell, CRISPR technology, genetic modification, cloning, all of these things, if we're gonna take that lead, we have to be mindful of that. I think in oncology, we have remained leaders because the long time ago, the FDA said, well, for oncology, the survivals are so poor that we will let people kind of run more free than in other fields because the patients have really no other options. And that, that is why we remain relatively on the, you know, the cutting edge of the game in oncology, but in other fields, we are not. Um, you talk about AI and machine learning in the black box. So I have a long history with, with machine learning. I wrote neural networks in the 1980s when I was a high school student. So, um, so I, I've, I've watched all of this evolve. I was a computer science major and stuff, so I, I'm nerd turned doctor, which may be nerd turned more nerd. Um, but I think, so here's the thing. If we had all of the exposures and all of the exposure data and it were reliable and homogeneous and all of that stuff, and we could really well define the outcomes. And the neural network worked very well. We wouldn't care what's in the black box. 
But the problem is that the neural networks don't work very well. Mm -hmm. And so I can't trust what the neural network tells me at face value anyway, because I know there's a lot of stuff missing. There's a lot of exposures that weren't measured. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the measure. There's you know, an entire PhD in epidemiology that you can get at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health that can tell you all of the things that are wrong with these machine approaches to trying to understand medicine. So if anything is going to help me at all, I need to know what went into it right. so that I can think about whether, you know, let's say one of the variables was diabetes. Okay, we're going to predict how well somebody's going to do after an MI based on whether they're diabetic or not. That seems totally sensible. The, the term diabetes can be a range from zero to seven billion of how much diabetes you have, right? And how bad it is that your disease is. And if my patient is a brittle diabetic who I think is, you know, one will die from a haircut, then I will value the, the, um, the, uh, the magnitude of that diabetes risk factor very differently from if my patient is totally diet controlled, no problem at all, I barely consider them diabetic. So if I know what's involved in the machine algorithm, then I can titrate that based on what I know about my patient that the machine will never know about my patient. If it's just a black box, I have no idea how much diabetes contributed to that risk prediction. And so I really have, I have no way of sort of understanding that black box. And that is one of the major problems in, you know, machine learning AI-based practice of medicine. Now, that works totally fine in light bulb factories, right? Because in light bulb factories, there's a lot more reliable mechanistic data there. There's, there you're, you're, there's stuff like physics, right? Physics, physics has equations and math and a, like there are, you know, they're, they're fundamental concepts in physics. In medicine, it's just a series of observations without a whole lot of well-understood fundamental concepts. And so as a result, it is very difficult for those algorithms to replace the intuition that a clinician has. And it's very difficult to get that kind of intuition. Okay, we okay. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, because I teach the big data machine learning AI course in the business <laughs> world. And I say this to the students, and I, maybe I'm wrong in this, right? But imagine the following, right? And I'd love to hear your perspective, given your rich history of neural networks, right? But right now we have access to 23andMe, which is like sort of DNA. We never had that before, right? In a re readily usable form. We have access to like our heart rate and how we sleep with our Fitbits, right? And we never really had that before. So we are sensing a lot more than we did before, right? And like my understanding is how this neural network is working. I, I agree, it's a little bit of a black box, but it's basically a map in a very high dimensional space and you can overfit whatever you want, right? But there are some techniques to reduce overfitting. Uh, the, the, the goal is to predict out of sample, not in sample. That's too easy. You can you know, fit any pattern with the, you know, the computational powers we have, right? So my, my question to you is, yes, I agree with you that um, you know, there are some limitations to neural networks. But so far, in every field that we've concentrated our efforts with enough data, right, the neural network has matched the best humans, but not exceeded them slightly, right? And so why wouldn't it be also the case if we picked a very narrow task in medicine? Not everything, I mean, there's no, right now we're not general purpose AI, right? Just because specific like sepsis, right? That you know, Suchi is trying to sort of be able to predict just one thing, right? And we throw enough data at it, and when we fire up the neural network and we you know, throw it in the cloud or whatever, right? Why can't we just start solving these small, narrow problems like we do in every other industry so far, excluding maybe trading securities, right? And so I'm thinking, and I don't know the answer, I'd love to hear your thoughts. The human body works a little more, I think, like you know, some kind of structure that we don't fully understand, but is repeatable, right? Now, so my question is, if you took the same person and cloned them, you put them through everything the same, and one person caught cancer, right? You know, would the other person, the, 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 the clone also? I think that's the problem, is too, there's too many variables. It's almost like a butterfly effect. Like, there's, 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 there's all kinds of stuff with people who pray and, and they, they beat cancer. Who knows how that happened? I, I think that's exactly, what Exactly, but here's the, the, here's the issue. Human beings can only process about eight different variables at a time. 
The neural network can process 80,000, 800,000, 8 million, no problem. That is beyond the capability, at least right now, of human beings. So I would even argue that, you know, just because we're human beings, we're limited. Whereas as the computational power increases, right? Whether it's eight variables or eight million variables, a neural network can process it, right? And we have computational power in order to split it up and distribute it and do all this other stuff. Um, and all I'm thinking about right now is narrow tasks, right? What, it, what, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and so... I'm sure you heard this before from all the other guys on computer science, right? Oh, I, yeah, I, I <laughs> speak every year at Web Summit and Collision, so I, I get this, oh, I get this shit all the time. <laughs> Um, so, so there are very good examples of what I think are good uses of AI machine learning in medicine. And most of the examples now center around imaging and pathology, which is also a type of imaging. Um, and in all of the cases that, I, that I'm familiar with, the deal is this. If you have an expert in the room who has an hour to dedicate to this task, they will outperform the machine. Or maybe the same. But for the most part, they're going to bring, because they're, they bring, they can't process 8 million variables, but they can process um, mechanistic logic that they know about the, you know, what is going on. But if you put the machine up at, for imaging and pathology against either a novice or somebody who's in a hurry, then the AI algorithm does outperform them. So, and, and there are many instances, and so I always tell people, if you're, if you're gonna make an AI thing that's actually gonna be useful to somebody who takes care of patients, what you have to do is you have to find a, a scenario where decisions have to be made in a hurry, or have to be made by somebody who's not necessarily as experienced middle of the night decisions, quick decisions for, you know, um, treatment path, you know, treatment tree decisions, or screening. Okay, so if, for example, you know, I see 100 patients in clinic in a day, and I don't have time to, like, look at their last two months worth of Fitbits and health records and stuff like that, but if the algorithm says, don't ask me how I know, but I think that this part, because that's what a neural net means, right? Don't ask me how I know, I just know, Jewish mother, right? If, if the Jewish mother says, this person might be in trouble soon, look at them more carefully, spend 20 minutes with them instead of 10, now you may be onto something. You may be doing something useful. If the imaging says, I know you're the ER resident reading this as a trauma scan, but I'm trained to look for subtle signs of brain aneurysms, and I found this thing, and you should probably look in that area because I'm worried that there's something there. Then you're directing somebody who's on a very, very fast-focused task to look in a different area that they may have missed. So I think imaging, pathology, hurried decisions, I think that's where it's gonna be useful. I think when somebody has a lot of time to sit down and to really review things, they're going, because of the heterogeneity of data, the, you know, the complexity, you know, not just whether they pray or not, but, you know, oh, but that's that's one little example. example. But the, the complexity of what happens to people that we don't capture, right? All of that stuff, there's going to be, intuition will drive that more than, than you know, algorithms, will, than, than black box algorithms will drive that. But what, what has been very useful has been the, you know, there are types of machine learning where you do get the covariates out, right? Where it does tell you, we think that these eight things are the most important. And we see that, for example, you go to the American College of Surgeons website, people enter information about their patients and they get six month, one year, you know, predicted mortality. Now they know that it's kind of, eh, but it gives them a sense of, you know, oh, I thought you were doing well. The computer thinks you're not doing well at all. Let's try to sort of, you know, make sense of that. So my point, and, and just so you know, the reason I'm getting closest for the shots, if I zoom in, it'll work. So it's just TV. <laughs> Everything's close in TV. Right, exactly. Um, I think the right analogy, right, is in voice recognition. 
right? So if I have someone who may be a baby, I can make sense of my little daughter, a machine probably couldn't, you know, or if there's, if there's definitely, if you speak fast, I speak very fast, you know what I mean, like Harvard, and a human being can understand other human beings, even if you're speaking another language, you may, it may be tonality, it may be body, you know, uh, language, it may be all of these things, much better than machines. The machines are getting better. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in machine learning, big data. I think we'll get there. But I think I think that the the the, the sort of tech community maybe oversimplifies how absolutely complex this is and how skilled the clinicians are today. I don't think we're there yet. That's my own sort of view of it, right? But I, I want to hear from someone who's actually out there day to day. Katie, talk to us. Let's tee up some questions. What do you see? Talk to Dr. Sagan, please. All right, well, I think first and foremost, I need to take your class, Professor, to learn a little bit more about all of this. I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit. Um, I had the privilege and honor to do a few kidney transplants alongside um, Dr. Sagan back during my surgical residency in 2008. So we're now almost over 10 years later, and you've recently performed the first HIV to HIV kidney transplant. So I one want you to explain your, um, you know, talk a little bit about your experience with that and working with policymakers. And then where do you see us in 2029? Because we have a lot of very young healthcare professionals here in this room who really want to advance things forward, and um, we're looking to to hear where you see the future of healthcare in 10 years. Okay. Um, yeah. So. One of the advantages of being in Baltimore is that we're a quick train ride from DC. And, well, some years, some years it's a pleasant advantage, some years it's an unpleasant advantage. Um, but we, so I, when I was younger, I did a, a congressional fellowship and learned sort of how laws are passed in Congress. And I've actually written two congressional bills that got passed. One was, um, about 12 years ago um, to make kidney exchanges legal in the United States and we basically laid out the entire mathematical framework using operations research technology um, to do kidney exchanges across the country and um, since that bill was passed there have been about 7,000 transplants performed through kidney exchanges and it represents a solid 25% of the transplants we do today. So there's, this is sort of a, when you get a cool idea, and this was, a, this was like a, a mathy idea, when you get a cool idea, you can really um, change policy. The reason a bill was needed was that the, um, the way the law is phrased that you can't buy or sell organs is, um, thanks to lawyers, <laughs> yeah. just, just kind of, is that you can't exchange organs for valuable consideration. And there, the DOJ told us that exchanging an organ for an organ might be construed as valuable consideration. So we wrote a law that basically said a kidney exchange is not valuable consideration and somehow got that passed. Um, so, you know, when you have cool ideas, even if they violate federal congressional law, there are ways to put those into play. And the second, um, idea that we had that, that uh, you referred to was the law overseeing organ transplantation was written in the 1980s and we all know what HIV was like in the 1980s it was basically a death sentence today HIV is a chronic condition people with HIV live totally full and normal lives provided that we can control the HIV which in almost everybody we can and so in the 80s when the, the law was written it said you can't transplant organs from donors with HIV. It was the only disease actually specified in that law, period. Everything else, you know, we can, we actually put, take organs from people who have hepatitis C and put them into people who are hepatitis C negative because we have a treatment for hepatitis C now and that is totally legal because in the 1980s, hepatitis C didn't even exist, right? So they kind of picked on HIV for kind of good reasons in the 80s, not good reasons at all in the last 20 years. And so. Um, about 10 years ago, it occurred to me that we were throwing away a lot of HIV-positive organs, that really we should be putting them to people with HIV. The, the, the medicine had evolved to the point where it was totally safe to do so. So, you know, again, it was a, um, a clinical practice inspires research. We did mathematical research to estimate the number of donors that could possibly be and how much money Medicare would save from that. So a side note, if you are working in 
kidney disease, okay? The, the only universal healthcare system that we have in the United States is end-stage renal disease. If you have kidney failure, you have Medicare. You have universal healthcare. And as a result, Medicare has to pay for your dialysis, so if we transplant you, we save Medicare money. This was, the, the history behind this is long and interesting, but we won't get into it right now. Um, but so we were able to actually go to Congress and say, look, you will save Medicare money if you use HIV positive donors. And they're like, oh, money, money, we like saving people money. <laughs> and so that actually got the bill passed and you know, went through all of the other iterations of healthcare policy at the different levels. Um, and we were able to do that. And now we have a national NIH funded protocol on doing HIV to HIV transplants across the United States. And a few months ago, we let the first person living with HIV become a living kidney donor, which again was totally unheard of 10 years ago, let alone 30 or 40 years ago. And you know, when that made the press, the thing that I told the press, the thing I was most proud of was that, you know, in the 1980s, HIV looked like a death sentence and the scariest thing in the world. And in 2019, HIV looks like a 35-year-old master's level CDC employee marathon runner who donated the kidney to a stranger that she had not and never will meet um, because she can't, you know, and like that's that's what living with HIV means today. And so this was a really exciting sort of paradigm shift. And again, another example that if you have paradigm shifting ideas, it may take some time, but you can even overcome congressional limitations. Um, and I would, I guess, I would see the generalization to a room full of, you know, entrepreneurs or hopeful future entrepreneurs that you know, getting. Congress to change laws is probably about the same level of uphill battle, beating head against wall on a daily basis with the pain um, kind of endeavor as you know entrepreneurialism is. And so, when there are cool ideas, ultimately they will stick, but it just takes some time to do that. Where are we going to be in ten years? Um, transplant is a very exciting field. And one of the reasons I like being in this field is that every five years I don't really recognize the field. And there's a lot of incredible technology being leveraged today in transplantation. And so I'll talk about not just transplant surgery, but just in the entire field of replacing people's organs, right? We have, so today, if you join the kidney transplant waiting list today, you have a higher chance of dying than getting an organ offer. So we have this profound organ shortage. Um, and there are a couple of novel tech-based ways that people are trying to expand the, the donor pool. Um, one of them is through regenerative medicine. So, you know, it's one thing to like print an ear on a 3D printer. It's another thing to print something that actually is physiologically active and can accomplish things like that a kidney or a liver can do. But we're getting close and I think 10 years from now we'll either have it or we'll be close to having it. I think because it's accelerated a lot in the last few years and the technology has accelerated a lot. And the good thing is that if we manufacture organs, I still have a job because I still get to sew the damn things in. Right. <laughs> um, but I think that we, I think by 10 years, you know, we, we will see something come of this. The, the flip side of this is xenotransplantation, which is, you know, taking something related to you, putting that into a pig, growing it in a pig, and then, you know, blocking your immune system so that it won't reject the pig organs, and then, you know, having it grafted in that way. The, people have said that xenotransplantation is the future of organ transplantation, and always will be, um, if you understand what I mean by that. So, um, yeah, it will, and, and having just been to another Xeno advisory board, I can tell you, I don't see 10 years from now us being able to successfully do xenotransplantation. I think we'll learn a lot about antibodies and about the human body and, and immunology and stuff, but I don't see us doing Xeno in 10 years. I do potentially see us manufacturing organs in 10 years, and the beauty of manufactured organs is that your cells will be living on them and you will not reject them because they will be you. They will, you know, the, the, uh, um, the, the backbone will be inert 
materials and cells, and then the functional cells will be you and your HLA, and people won't even need immunosuppression, which is a beautiful thing. So if and when we can accomplish this, all of transplantation will change dramatically. And the beauty is that all of these struggles that we have with the immune system right now, which we learn exciting things about all the time, will be a complete no-brainer. And the you know issues of organ allocation, living donation, all of that other stuff will go away as well. And I hope that during my active, clinically active career, we see all of those things happen. Um, I, I see questions. Yeah, let, let's let's go, go go. Let's go down tangents. I have some other stuff I want to talk about, but let's go down this this road for. This is absolutely riveting. Uh, so right in alignment with what you were just saying, I'm curious your opinion about 3D printing of organs, and particularly uh, an area of interest of some of my colleagues in zero gravity environments where like collagen scaffolding wouldn't collapse under gravity that would facilitate that. Um, thoughts? I mean, to be honest, it's a really niche field in transplantation now. Um, I have worked very briefly in old school scaffold manufacturing stuff. I don't know what is going on in 2019 in scaffold manufacturing. I, CRG stuff. Yeah, I, I'm not, I don't have any expertise in that. I, I will say that the scaffolding is interesting and is exciting and may help people build more efficient scaffolds, but is not today probably not the rate of step. The rate limiting step is getting cells to grow on scaffolds that are that you know the recipient would not react to. Thank you. Uh, my question is for like FDA and, and the <clears throat> illegal med medicine. So this is obviously a big area where a lot of people are getting doing work and doing projects on. I'm curious what your thoughts are because you have a three hundred billion dollar business of illegal meds all over the world. Um, the FDA has lost a lot of high-end people because of the language, you know, the choice words of language and science, and so when research is going to be effective, what are your thoughts on on that? Um, I mean, because it's, it's, a, it's a big deal, and we're seeing medicine, not medicine, it's, it's an interesting topic at this point. Yeah, I mean, so the root cause of this, right, is that if I wanted to treat my hep C today in the United States, it would cost me, like, a 7 Series BMW, and if I went to Bangladesh, it would cost me 150 bucks. And that's, a, and that's a huge problem. It's not that I couldn't get it in Bangladesh at all. It's that I could get it, and it's high quality stuff, and it would cost me several zeros less than what I get in the United States. The old school justification for this, obviously, is that R&D is very expensive, and so you have to give people a monopoly for a certain number of years that they can hopefully charge reasonable amounts of money to pay off their R&D and maybe establish them for the next R&D endeavor that they have. That has gone completely off the rails, completely out of hand, and the globalization that we didn't have 40 years ago when all this stuff was being established is insane, right? The, like, it is so easy for anybody, a 13-year-old with a garage, to manufacture most of the drugs that are manufactured in the United States. So. I think that, and the problem is obviously who knows what this 13 year old's doing, or who knows even what this very high, high volume manufacturing plant in Bangladesh is doing, and will they, you know, will those have the same sort of um, quality assurance that drugs that are manufactured in the U.S. have? The answer is probably not quite the same, but if your choice is something you can afford versus something you cannot afford, for you, that's a non-issue, right? You are better off taking the extra 2% risk than you are not even being able to get the, the medication. So I think this is something that, you know, you talk about our losing our, our, uh, our edge globally. This is something we need to think about and we need to figure out how it is we're going to be creative in drug manufacturing keep enough money in drug manufacturing to where people still want to manufacture drugs, yet really sort of put a limit on that. And, you know, I think if, for example, the clinical practice, the world of clinical practice 
were like the world of pharmaceuticals, we would not have a very good clinical medical system in the United States either. Like, the incentive for people to practice medicine in the U.S. is because they help people. It's not for salaries. The salaries are for shit, you know, compared to the pharmaceutical industry or whatever. You know, compared to, like, you know, most jobs, they're great, but it's not the money that is drawing people into medicine. It's the desire to help people. And if we can figure out some sort of pharmaceutical industry where the desire would be, I want to go into pharmaceuticals because I want to help people sort of at a higher level. And yeah, there's some money there, but there aren't, you know, there aren't these, you know, multi-million dollar, billion dollar salaries that come from one particular drug that happens to blow up. I think that would be helpful, and that would help us actually regain some of the, the edge that we have globally. I just want to echo. I wanted to echo what you just said. Uh, I think uh, one of the big components about entrepreneurship is not just creating, creating a new company or uh, you know, something we can scale or make a lot of money. The, the core of it is for us to start thinking in, in ways to improve where we are as a society from all angles and kind of get out of the the same status quo, the so-called rep that we keep making do every year. And so now we're thinking, and I think that's the great part about entrepreneurship, to start thinking about, okay, it might sound crazy, but let's try to do it. I would say that um, if, if people are seeking new ideas or um, new inspiration for ideas or potential collaborations, there, there will be a lot changing about how we operate on people in the next 10 years. There has been a lot that changed about how we operate people over the last 10 years, and things are becoming more minimally invasive. The, um, the instrumental support that those doing the operating can get from machines is quite high level. Another good area for rapid AI is things that a machine can figure out very, very quickly in the operating room that you cannot figure out that quickly and that those decisions need to be made very quickly. I think a lot will be changing in the OR in the next 10 years and if anyone is interested in medical entrepreneurship, go visit an OR, go watch the surgery, Go talk to people who are actually doing this because the OR is a wacky ass place and you, <laughs> you have no idea what is going on in the operating room until you've spent some time there. You, I, I will tell you, you can watch as many YouTube videos as you possibly want, as many episodes of Grey's Anatomy. You have zero idea what's going on in the operating room in terms of the very high tech stuff and the very completely asinine stuff that we do in the operating room that can be helped. And I will just give you one dumb example of this. All minimally invasive surgery that we do requires a camera to be inserted, for example, into the abdomen so that when I work with laparoscopic instruments, I can see what the hell is going on. That camera has a less high-tech system for cleaning itself than my windshield does on my car. And I spend literally probably 10% of the time that I am in the operating room pulling that thing out every time it gets sprayed and trying desperately to clean it and put it back in. And there, this is the dumbest thing that happens in the operating room for laparoscopic surgery, yet no one has been able to figure out some better way of doing this. So the, the opportunities abound with the literally like 1950s technological stuff that we're doing in the operating room in the setting of 2019 robotic technology. So, you know, if you're interested in this, and I think a lot of medical entrepreneurship will be surgical entrepreneurship because it's device development, it's instrument development, it's tool development, you know, drugs, drug development is, is it, it's not an entrepreneurial game. It's it's a very sort of long game kind of uh, thing. And there are very, very few drugs that come out now that I think are particularly impressive. Let's take one more question and then I'll just do a very, very compressed 
fireside chat here is we want to get to the rest of the panel, so we'll do some, I've got some rapid fire questions that we'll get to. Olga. I just have a quick question. So I'm um, familiar with some research that's being done right now on the cryopreservation of limbs. Um, so I'm kind of just want to, out of curiosity, hear what your thoughts are in regards of the organ cryopreservation. And you know, 10 years from now, will we be able to utilize um, not only organ donors, but just you know, deceased patients that, that can just have the cryopreservation of their organs, the utilization of that? Yeah, so cryopreservation of Organ transplants is interesting because for me, one of the biggest challenges with understanding the potential impact of prior preservation is why do I need to put an organ in a freezer for 10 years? Because there's probably somebody today who needs that organ anyway. Now, can I, would it help me to be able to take the organ out and wait three days to transplant it? Yes, and there's a lot of technology that's being explored in transplantation for um, for uh, extending the window that an organ can be outside of the body before I have to transplant it, before it starts to develop the ischemia. Um, and I think that, that those technologies, the technologies that are used in cryopreservation may be sort of the next level of technologies for extending cold ischemia time. In terms of organ banks and a future of organ banks, I don't see that happening mostly because I think the timeline that we would need to really create something like that, we're going to be printing the organs way before we ever figure out that aspect of, you know, sort of regain functionality and things like that. Okay, thank you. Have you heard of Polarity? No. Uh, Polarity. Uh, Polarity is a company that's going to stay. See, this, this kind of shit we do in the OR all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Here's yes. A 2019, nice, you know, unidirectional microphone, 4K video <laughs> machine, yeah, yeah. and you're like pulling on some <laughs> 1950s technology thing to get the power. But that kind of stuff we do in the OR left and right. <laughs> and that's why that's why Olga, Sophia, and I have a job. The <laughs> can help with epic and the defogging. <laughs> so let, let me. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. The doctor, right? Will there ever be a transplant for a kidney or whatever the organ is for someone with HIV or non-HIV? Are we ever going to put HIV positive organs into HIV negative people? Yes. Two things keeping us from doing that right now. One is there's enough HIV positive people awaiting organs that we don't have a surplus of HIV positive organs. Unlike Hep C, where we have a huge surplus of Hep C organs thanks to the opioid epidemic and tons of people dying from drug overdoses who have Hep C and nobody on our list who has Hep C because we've already transplanted all of those. Well, that's one. The second thing is that really the only safe time to be able to pull that trigger is when we've cured HIV. We can cure Hep C now. We can completely eliminate it. The, the, the only, I'll say only in big quotes, the only thing we can do with, with HIV is drive it back into the lymph nodes to hide. Now, if you keep it hidden, that's wonderful, but you don't want to take that and put it into somebody else and then give them that as well. Until either you have a surplus of organs or you figure out some, some way of treatment. 